All right, it's time to get started recording another radio broadcast today. We certainly are thankful for this great privilege we have to be able to come to you by means of radio and, uh, or I should say, by means of social media. Amen. But we'll be on the radio in a minute. Thank you so much for watching via our social media outlets. That's a great blessing to us. And we certainly are grateful for those of you who like and share our videos. That certainly increases the amount of people that we can reach. And we certainly are thankful that you do that for us. All right, we're going to get started now recording our radio program. Amen. Well, it's good to be back on the radio today. We certainly are thankful for this great opportunity that God has given us to be able to preach on the radio. We certainly are undeserving of the blessings of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord, but nonetheless, we are extremely grateful for them. And we're grateful that we're able to come to you by radio each week. We're certainly thankful for the folks who make this possible. And we're thankful for those of you who faithfully listen to the program as well. Well, we've been in Psalm 17, I think, for three weeks now. And we have at least a couple of more weeks probably in the psalm as well. This psalm is a prayer of David. We've mentioned on several occasions and although almost all of the Psalms, a very large number of them at least, include prayers, there's only a handful, five I believe in total, that are actually titled as a prayer. And Psalm 17 is the first of those five found in the book of Psalms. Well, we have made it to verse number seven of this Psalm 17, which consists of 15 verses. And so we're going to pray and we're going to get right into that with the help of the Lord today. Father, we are grateful for this opportunity. We thank you so much, Lord, for making it available unto us. And I pray that you would help us today to say something that would certainly be a help and encouragement to your people and a blessing to them as well. Please help us to be a blessing to you first and foremost. And I pray, uh, Lord, that if someone's listening somewhere around the world, uh, that needs a Savior, I pray you'd speak to their heart, minister the, the, to them according to their need of a Savior, help them to be saved. Even today we pray in Jesus' name. All right, Psalm 17, we talked about in the first four verses, we talked about David craving justice um, but before his oppressors, those who were oppressing him. And he certainly was desiring justice for them. Now, in verses 5 and 6, which we talked about in great detail on last week, David requests of the Lord grace that he might act favorably or act in a rightly, maybe I should say, while being under such great stress and a great trial. And that's certainly a prayer that I need to pray as well. God help me. When I am in a great deal of stress or certainly under some great burden or some great trial, Lord, please help me to behave proper, properly. Please help me to remain a Christian. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. There's a lot of folks who are saved who certainly do not resemble Christ. And I always want to properly represent and resemble my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today... We, as we begin in verse number 7 and verses 7 through 12, David seeks protection from his foes and he describes the enemy in great detail in these verses as well. Now, as we went off of the broadcast on last week, we did mention a couple of things at the very beginning of verse number 7, but we'll start there today. We will not go back and do any... Um, repeating of things that we've already said or, or no refreshing, maybe I should say, of things that we've already said for the sake of time. So Psalm 17, verse number 7, the Bible says, Shew thy mar marvelous loving kindness, O thou that save us by thy right hand, them that put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. So first of all, the first part of verse number 7, it says, Show thy marvelous loving kindness. David here in this psalm, even though we don't really know exactly what it is, but we certainly can understand from the psalm that he is in imminent danger. And even though David has a great reputation of being a warrior himself, 
having, with the help of God, not of his own merit, of his own strength, he has been able to accomplish some amazing feats in his own right, defeating some very formidable enemies uh, with his bare hands, killing the lion and a bear, and with a simple, simple weaponry of a sling and a stone, slaying the giant. And yet David here is faced with something that is bigger than he is able to handle on his own. But however, David, uh, he is completely expectant of the fact that God, simply because of his marvelous loving kindness, is going to be able to deliver him yet again. Now, I'll, I'll read some verses here in just a moment, but I want to say something, just something about this right here. David is not expecting God to do this because he's worthy. David is not expecting God to do this for him because David has been something spectacular or because David has done something miraculous in his own right that has merited God's favor. No, he's very plain in telling us here that he is expecting God to, to do exactly and only what God can do simply because of God's marvelous loving kindness. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the loving kindness of God, and I really like the way that it's worded here in this psalm. His loving kindness is marvelous, and it is beyond our comprehension. It is beyond our ability to articulate. It is, it is beyond our ability. Um, even uh, accomplished orators have no have no vocabulary in which they can explain the marvelous loving kindness of Almighty God. And so David, even though he has faced formidable enemies in the past, and even though God has granted him victory over, over uh, things that there's no way, no humanly possible way that those battles could have been won, David, because of his experience with God and the fact that he would hear an answer, he is totally dependent upon the loving kindness of God to deliver him yet again. And I'm glad we can do that as well. In fact, when we pray, we should pray with faith in faith, believing that God will show his loving kindness unto us. Now, as I say that, as I'm sitting here on this day recording this radio program, I am mindful of my own sinfulness. I am mindful of my own undeservingness, my own unworthiness. And I realize that God is under no obligation at all whatsoever to do anything for me because I am so undeserving. And yet I also realize and I also have confidence, not in myself, not in anything that I have done, not in any merit of my own, but I am extremely confident in the loving kindness of God that when you and I, as His children, pray unto Him with burdens and with needs, that God is well able not only to hear those needs, but also to respond in such a way that manifests even more His marvelous loving kindness to you and I. Now, I read this quote at the end of the last broadcast, but I want to read it again. It's a quote from the Treasures of David. And it says, O Lord, show thy marvelous loving kindness, show it to my intellect, and remove my ignorance. It says, Show it to my heart and revive my gratitude. Show it to my faith and renew my conscience. Show or confidence, I should say. Show it to my experience and deliver me from all my fears. Listen, we need to once again see the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord. It will remove our ignorance. We need to see the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord but so that it will revive our gratitude for what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do in our life. It needs to be shown unto our faith that our confidence might be renewed in the Lord. And it need, we, need to, we need to once again see the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord. We need to experience it, amen, that we may be delivered from all of our fears. Now, as I've been reading this passage in Psalms again and reading over my notes in preparation for this broadcast, I have 
I have noticed, and it's amazing how that life events and circumstances cause you uh, to have a different look a lot of times at the Scriptures, not that the Scriptures has changed by any means. God's Word does not change. It's forever settled. But God is constantly changing us as we grow in our walk with Christ and our Christian life, and we continue to see things oftentimes from a different angle than we have saw in times past. And so I am continually noticing how often we are needing help for our fears. And we are certainly living in uh, fearful times in our nation. And uh, so I, I'm glad that our trust can still be in the Lord, regardless of what's going on around us. The Bible says in Psalm 31, and verse number 9, it says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Now, this is another thing that I've noticed in these Psalms and these studies as well. All of us fear something, but what we need to fear is the Lord. And now, here, here's the thing about that. I've just gotten through with, with mentioning about the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord, and yet the very next verse that I read in the Psalm talks about us fearing Him. Why would we fear someone who has marvelous loving kindness? Listen, we ought, we ought to be more afraid in what God is capable of doing to us then we are afraid of what any man might do unto us. And if we, had a, if we had that kind of fear of God and we trusted Him, we would be far less fearful of the things of this world. So the Bible says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. So we saw his marvelous loving kindness in Psalm 17. And here in Psalm 31, we see his marvelous kindness in a strong city. It says for verse 22, for I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplication when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Now listen, we need to hope in the Lord. I don't know what your hope is in, but it better be in the Lord. Amen. We need to be a good courage. Now, we have had the privilege of living in America where well, there's not been much religious persecution at all. And for that, I am grateful. I'm not, I am not in one, one way at all against that. I am thankful that we have been free from religious persecution. But as we begin to enter into that stage, even in our own country, we need some believers who will be of good courage and shall strengthen your heart. The Bible says, The Lord preserveth the faithful. He perennially rewardeth the proud doer. And so for that, we can be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Now notice, I want you to notice something about this passage of Scripture. Hey, we're still talking about the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord. It comes by fearing Him and putting our trust in Him. And then the Bible says to be of good courage. And when we are of good courage, God will strengthen our heart. Listen, we have an invisible enemy the day that we're living in. We, we have an obvious enemy with the government and, some, and things that are coming. We understand that. But we also have a very real enemy that is an unseen enemy. And that is a virus that is very real. Now, nonetheless, we are to have our confidence in the Lord. We are to have our trust in the Lord. We are to fear Him. We are to be of good courage. And when we are, the Lord will strengthen our heart. Listen, the reason some of you are so faint-hearted is because you have no courage. Now, I'm not David. Now, you think about this. You think about, hey, are you talking about stuff going together here? Here we have David, and we've made mention of the fact that he has been able to defeat the bear, and he's been able to defeat the lion with his bare hands, and he went against this giant Goliath with a rock and a swing, sling, 
He refused Saul's armor. He would not wear that. When all the men of Israel, all the mighty men, all the warriors of Israel were cowering in shame and, dis- and disgrace because of their fear, as a young lad, he boldly went out against that enemy. Now, listen to this. He had to be of good courage. I promise you that God strengthened his heart. I promise you that God won the battle and gave him the victory. But somewhere in David's own heart, he had to have some courage. He would have never known that God could strengthen his heart. He would have never known that God could give him the victory if he were afraid to face the bear, if he were afraid to face the lion, if he were afraid to face Goliath, he would have never known the marvelous loving kindness of God had he not trusted that he was able to help him and to give him the strengthening of his heart because he was of good hurt courage. Isn't you're listening today and you're cowering. You're, you're afraid. You, you're afraid to witness. You're afraid to stand up for Christ. You're afraid to leave your home. You're, you're afraid to participate. You're, you're, you're scared to them. And listen, I, I, I promise you, I'm not making light of anything or anybody's circumstance. I'm simply telling you that we have got to continue to trust God in the face of opposition. We've got to continue to believe that God is able and that His marvelous loving kindness this is going to take care of us in spite of everything that's going on in the world today. Now, let's go back to our verse. We've gotten way off topic and way away from all of our notes. But he said, Shew thy marvelous love and kindness. Now, notice the next phrase. O thou that save us by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee. So let's look at this first little part first. O thou that save us by thy right hand. Now, he's either talking about by his own power or by the man at his right hand, being his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't don't miss this. Them that put their trust in thee. Listen, listen, listen. This is very simple. There is nothing, there is nothing elaborate about this at all. This, this is very, this is, uh, I, I don't know what to call it. It's, it's so minor. But I want to tell you something. The Lord delivers those that trust in him. And that's that, the, he, he said, Oh, thou save us by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee. Listen, many of you, you're, you're putting your trust in men. You're putting your trust in the arm of the flesh. You're, you're, you're trusting in self or in someone else. You're, you're trusting in your own power. You're trusting in your own wisdom. You're trusting in your own righteousness. You're trusting in your own riches. And listen, we, none of those things, none of those things are going to help us. We must put our trust in. In the Lord, amen. He is our God. He is the one who has saved us, who is continuing to save us, and who will ultimately save us. Now, I I say things like that, and these folks who are all messed up in their doctrine, they get all bent out of shape. Listen, I have been saved from sin. I am daily being saved from sin. And one of these days, I will ultimately be saved from the very presence of sin. And so I am extremely grateful for the marvelous loving kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He he is the Savior of all men, but He is especially the Savior to them that believe. For those He saves both temporally and eternally. Ain't that a blessing? Now, he says, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. So listen, we have many spiritual enemies and uh, our spiritual enemies are sin and Satan and self and the flesh and the world and the pride of life and and our eyes and all, all kinds of things. But I'm glad that the Lord is able to keep us from those that rise up against us. Listen, there are, there's evil and wicked men in the world. There's oppressors and violent persecutors. But God is able to save us from every enemy that rises up against us. Listen, I like this. Psalm 5 says this. Psalm 5, verse 11. It says, But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compassion? him as with a with favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield so look I, I am glad that if we put our trust in the Lord we can rejoice we can ever shout for joy the Bible says and uh, the Lord will bless the righteous and he will favor us 
as well. The Bible says in Psalm 20, verse number six, Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with saving, with the saving strength of his right hand. Listen, I'm glad that God is able to save us. God is able to help us. God is able to deliver us. We should have our faith and our trust in Him. Now, I'll come back to Psalm 17. So, Psalm 7 said, Shew thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. Verse 8 says, Keep me as the apple of, thy, of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Now, David here uses two images. He uses the eye and the wings to remind God that he was precious to him. In fact, the apple, he said, keep me as the apple of the eye. You know, the apple of the eye is the pupil. It's the most delicate part of the eye. It has been referred to as the little man of the eye. And the reason for that is if you're close enough to someone and you look directly into their eyes, you can see yourself you can see your own reflection in their eyes. And so it is referred to the apple of the eye as the pupil of the eye or the little man of the eye. And so David, David desired to be so close. Here's what I get from that. David desired to be so close to God that he could see himself in God's eyes. Now, just as we have, have built in protection for our eyes, our, our, um, uh, there are water ducts in our eyes. There is the reflexes of our eyes and our eyelids. And our eyes are very tender and they're very precious, but they're also uh, very much so protected. That's the way that God made them. And so David here, he wants to be the apple of God's eye. He wants to be so close to God that he can see himself in God's eyes. And he wants the protection. He wants God's protection to be as, as wonderful to him as our own eye protection is to our eyes. Listen, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, verse number 9, the Bible says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Number two, verse 10, he found him in a desert land, in a waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. Look at this. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So, David here, we, we see the apple of his eye. Then he said, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. So the phrase, under the shadow of thy wings, sometimes, and we get this from the Bible, we have pictures of the mother hen gathering the young under her, her, her witties, I think they're called, the baby chickens, gathering them underneath her wings that she may protect them. And I've, I've heard all kinds of stories about that and all kinds of uh, tales of fire and storm and all of that, even the mother hen being killed, sacrificed in her own life. And uh, when she is, is found or after the storm or the fire is over, the little ones that were under her wings would be protected. And so David here, he, he gives us two analogies he, he, he is so dependent upon God's marvelous loving kindness that he understands that, that he, he can be the apple of God's eye and he can be under the shadow or under the protection of his wings. In fact, Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, and he's talking about Jerusalem. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So the Lord tells Jerusalem, he said, look, I, I sent these prophets unto you, and uh, I, I had a desire to gather you under my wings as a, as a hen gathers her chickens, and you wouldn't have anything to do with it. Listen, friend, there are many, there are many today in our time they, they have more confidence in what the doctor says, and they have more confidence in what, what that liberal news media, that garbage that's being spewed out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and you're drinking it like Kool-Aid, and it's poisoning your mind like rat poison. You're believing every single word that they're spewing out of their antichrist mouth, and God is screaming to you in His marvelous loving kindness, 
I, why don't you trust me? You, you can be the apple of my eye. I can gather you under the shadow of my wing. I can love you. I can protect you. I can help you. I can keep you. And yet you are more dependent and more determined to follow the things of the world and the ways of the world than you are God himself. The Bible says in Exodus 25, verse number 18, it says, and thou shalt make two cherubims. Still talking about this shadow of his wing. Maybe the phrase under the shadow of his wing could also refer to the wings of the cherubim and uh, the wings of the cherubim that were placed over the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And we'll read about that in Exodus 25, verse 18. It says, And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. So maybe it was, maybe it was that David was asking the Lord to make his hiding place in the, in a, into a holy of holies, to make his hiding place a place of God's throne and God's glory being protected by the angels of God themselves. And so, listen, Psalm 36 and verse number 5 says this, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches under the clouds. Thy righteousness is like, a great, is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Now listen, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 57, 1 says, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overplayed. overplayed. Now listen, overpass. There is no safer place in all of the world than under the shadow of of his wings. The Bible says in Psalm in Psalm 63 and verse number 7 because thou hast been my help therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Listen, David's desire was to be so near to God, to be near enough to God that he could see his own reflection in his eyes and that he could feel the warmth and the protection of his merciful arms. And listen friend, you and I that should also be our desire. It should be the desire of every born-again believer. Uh, it should be, our desire should be that we be so close to God, we could see our reflection in Him, and that we could feel the warmth of His arms as those witties do the warmth of that mother hen when they gather themselves under her wings. Listen, God help us. God help us to never wander out of His sight. And God help us to never get out of his reach. Now, I know I make a comment like that again. The emails are going to start coming and the phone calls. And they're going to say, preacher, don't you know that you can't get out of God's sight? And don't you know that I know that we can't get out of God's sight? And I know that we cannot get out of God's reach. But physically speaking, you understand what I'm saying and you understand the analogy. Instead of going away from God, we ought to be drawing nigh to God. Instead of being distant from God, we ought to desire to be near him. Especially in these days that we're living, we ought to be we ought to be closer to God than ever before. And 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 I'm afraid that the majority has drifted farther away from Him instead of drawing nigh to Him. Listen, friend, there's ever been a day when we needed the church. It's now. And if there's ever been a time when the church has more been more forsaken than it's ever been, it's now. And listen. I, I'm not being critical. I'm not being judgmental. Uh, every pastor is responsible for his own flock. Every shepherd is responsible for his own flock. And everyone has to do whatever it is that they have to do, what they feel like they... No, don't do what you feel like you need to do. Do what the Bible says to do, amen. And so God has given us some direct instruction from His Word in the way that we should conduct ourselves, in the way that we should assemble ourselves, in the way that we should continue on in the things of God. So whatever means that is that is possible for you. I hope you've not forsaken God. I hope you've not forsaken the way of God. God hasn't changed. His word. Listen, if you preached before on being faithful to the house of God and you're not preaching it now, friend, you changed. God didn't change. His Bible didn't change. And His Word didn't change. And so God help you and I to put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. My time gone again, as always. Until next time, may God bless you is our prayer. Thank you so much for watching on our social media outlets. 
please, please share the broadcast, will you? It, it'll really help us reach more people. And for that, I will be extremely grateful. God bless you till we meet again. Goodbye.